think there we go <laughs> hope that works now yes okay I have never done a Facebook Live before, so I had a little free time on my hands today and I'm testing this out to see if it's something that people would tune in to see, um, if people find it helpful. Um, we're just playing around here to, to see what happens. Oh good, um, just got my first comment so somebody can actually see me and hear me. Yay. All right. On Vanilla Arts chat group, we usually on Friday, I give you these very large, these uh, very colorful photos. And I'm always asking students and members of the group, what color do you see in that photo? Um, and the goal is to get your hamster spinning on the wheel to um, try and start picking your own colors based upon the colors that you see in real life. And previously, I've just posted these and asked people, what color do you see? And, you know, there's a little bit of participation. Some people really enjoy it. But I have personally stayed out of it because I'm coming at this that, you know, it's it's my group and most of you are my students. So as your instructor, if I weigh in and say that I see, let's just say I see R20 in that photo, everybody is going to nod their head and say, oh yes, I see R20 in that photo. And then everybody's going to run over to the photo and try and find R20 because Amy said it, it must be right. When you're an instructor, um, you kind of get this automatic um, air of authority. So I haven't taken part in the conversation because I wanted you guys to decide what colors you see. That's the whole point of the of the exercise. Um, but I do understand that there is some value to having somebody else with authority tell you what they see. And then you kind of learn from that because you're looking, maybe you'll look at my suggestions and say, well, I don't see that. Where is she seeing that? And you can kind of research it. All of this is a long way of saying, I'm just trying to do this live because I thought about, like yesterday, I actually thought, sat down to type out my answer to what do I see in last week's image. So right there, that was last week's image. It's a cornflower, I believe. It's cornflower colored. Um, and I sat down to type out my answer and I thought, this is gonna take me forever to type out what I see. And then I thought, well, what if I turned it into something live? And I've never done anything Facebook live before, so this is me experimenting to see if this method works for you. All right, so if you haven't taken one of my classes, this is my coloring studio and I'm sitting here at my coloring desk. And I've kind of moved my um, markers a little bit closer. They're normally not really within hand's reach. They're normally back against the wall, but I've moved all my markers closer so that I can grab them while we're on camera here. Um, because I'm gonna take a look at that photo. I haven't thought about what colors I would use, but I'm just gonna walk you through the thought process for what I would use to color the cornflower image. Now that doesn't mean that I have a cornflower image for sale. This is just an inspirational photo, and these are some colors that I'm seeing in the photo reference, and we're just playing with color. Um, I'm gonna experiment with a few swatches. Yes, 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 I think I pulled out, yes, I pulled out some paper here. So I'm gonna experiment and just on the fly, think out loud so that you can see how I pick colors. And if enough people find this an educational experience, then maybe we'll do it again sometime, okay? Hope so. All right, so let me give you a shot of my desk. So this is my coloring desk where I normally work, but today I have my little iPad out with that cornflower um, photograph on there because this is normally how I pick colors. I have a digital representation of the photo on, this is an iPad Pro, but I also have just the, like a regular iPad that sometimes I work on. Um, this is the one that I draw on though. So, okay, so I've got that. Let me get rid of this photo just for a second. I'm looking at the color. I'm kind of blowing it up, just kind of getting a feel for the colors that I see in here. Because when you look at something as if it was a flower, when I'm taking in the whole flower, 
I'm thinking flower. And what I really want to do is think color. See, when you start to blow it up, we're seeing patches of color. So it's important to get the word flower out of your head. Get the words petal out of your head. You don't want to think of this as a flower when you're matching colors, when you're picking colors, because then that preconception stereotype of what a flower is, is going to get in your way. Now maybe flower is a bad example. Let me say we're looking at a raccoon. Let's say we're looking at the color of a raccoon. You're going to think in your head, somebody once told me that all raccoons are brown, so I need to be searching in the brown markers. When maybe the raccoon is actually more gray than brown. And if you look at a raccoon, I'm pretty sure they're more gray than brown. So your stereotype of a raccoon is going to send you to the wrong section of, I keep pointing to my markers over here. Your stereotype of a raccoon is going to send you in to the wrong section. So if you're trying to color a fire hydrant, I don't want you thinking fire hydrant because the stereotype is that the fire hydrant is red and your hand is going to reach for a red marker when maybe the fire hydrant is red but in this particular photo it looks more orange because the sun is shining down on it and it, you know there's a weird reflection or something. So you have to get the stereotype out of your head and for me putting it up digitally and just looking at those patches of color helps me remove the flower from the process and now i'm just looking at color straight color and i'm seeing blues and i'm seeing hmm seeing some whitish colors there but they have some tint to it and then when i'm going down in here i'm seeing whoa i'm getting into warm purples and there's some cool violets in here yeah there's there's a lot of colors here that we can choose from um so that's my next point is to simplify what we're looking at all right so once i have kind of given myself a color tour so that's my first step is to give myself a color tour and then i'm going to start um swatching markers and I know that there are some instructors who they're going to swatch something on a piece of paper. So they're going to they're going to put some color down on a piece of paper and then they're going to hold that up to the photo. And I do teach classes that way. It's a very simple way for students to start picking colors is to find a Copic that matches the color that you see on the screen, not the flower, but you're matching the color that you see on the screen. That's an easy way to do it, but that's not how I do it because I run into problems and I'm sure if you've ever tried this swatch it here and make you know match it to here if you've ever tried that method you've run into problems where let's say Copic doesn't make the color that you see right there what do you do if you're trying to match a color and Copic doesn't make it the color matching thing doesn't really work so um, I really never have done personally the color matching thing unless I really want to duplicate a photo exactly which isn't very often so once I've done that color tour remember I've wandered around and I've just kind of made some general observations about the colors that I see I see purple I see violet I see some blues then I go back and I look at the flower as a whole and this is a corn flower it kind of has that bluish violet vibe to it and here's where Copic kind of limits us because when I'm looking at my Copic blues and blue violets here, there's not a lot of blue that is shifted into the violet range. So when you say that a color is blue with a shift, that means it's leaning into the next color family. I need a blue that kind of leans in towards violet and Copic doesn't make a lot of blues that are solidly blue, not violet. If you move over into the BV family, you're getting things that feel far more violet than feel blue. And this flower really does feel blue. I can't shop in the BV section or I'm going to end up with a flower that everybody says, hey, that looks violet. So I got to shop in the blue section and there's only one family there that gives me that cornflower periwinkle kind of is it blue is it violet but it's mostly blue 
feeling and that's the b60 family so i'm just going to reach over here with my copics right to my copic area and i'm pulling out the b60 family with the intention that i'm going to swatch these and just kind of see what they look like and see what they feel like now i color for all of my beginners i color on express it blending card therefore i am swatching on express it blending card if this project was going to be on cryogen i would be swatching on cryogen if the project was on watercolor paper i would swatch on watercolor paper it does you absolutely no good to swatch on express it and then move over to watercolor paper or bristol board or something else because the colors look different on every single kind of paper that you try so when you're doing this experiment you need to be swatching on the paper that you intend to work with so today, let's just say we're swatching on Express It for an Express It based project. And I've got my B60 family here. So there's that's comprised of B69, B66, B63, and B60. And if you've taken many of my classes, you know we use the heck out of B60. So that's a family that I'm pretty darn used to. Um, and if I'm looking at the marker caps, remember marker caps are not always accurate. Um, so do I really see those colors there? It's, it's close. What I'm seeing up there in the photo feels a little bit more blue and this feels a little more violet, but I know that this is gonna have the right general vibe to it. So do I care that that's not an exact match? Not really because I know that if I hit the values correct, if I get my darks dark enough and my lights light enough and I get the darks in the right spot and the lights in the right spot, it's gonna look real based on just those values. The color is secondary to that. And I know that's really hard for people that are used to using blending combinations. You're used to um, people telling you this is the matching blending combination. No, you just need the values. You don't need the exact color. All right, so I've pulled these out because it's the vibe that I want, and that's just a general instinct. It's something that's in my heart and my soul and my brain kind of thing. It's a gut feeling. It's not what I'm looking at in the photo exactly. I want my flower to have this kind of vibe to it. So let me go ahead. I think I'll start with the light, and I'm just gonna pull off the chisel cap and give myself, that's the B60. Here's the 63, here's the 66, big jump there, and then here's the 69. And I can kind of move that over close to my swatch. In real life, I would be moving it over towards my iPad, just kind of comparing back and forth. And these feel more violet, but I really like the colors that are going on there. So that's what I'm gonna use. Um, yeah. All right, now, experience teaches you things. And what color is B69 named? Okay, it's called stratospheric blue, but I just happen to know from experience using this color, it's very aquamarine. It just, or not aquamarine, ultraviolet. It has a serious blue vibe to it. And I kind of want, see, as those pe flower petals go towards the center, we're leaning more towards violet and then eventually into purple. So I want to lean into that violet feeling. So I'm not liking how blue the B69 reads. And I just happen to know that B79 is this poor little ignored marker. It doesn't have any friends. There's no natural blending combination for B79. It doesn't have any partners. It's just this color that Copic threw out there and then gave you nothing to use with it. And, um, it's actually a nice nice little color because it's very close to B69, but it has more of a violet feel to it. So I think I want to use this B69 or B79 in place of the B69. So that's see how this one feels more violet. This one feels more blue, and I want to lean into that violet feeling because I know that as those petals get closer to the center of the flower, they're gonna get darker and deeper and I want something that's gonna help me transition more into the purple that's towards the center of that photo. So these are the colors I'm going to be playing with for my swatch. That feels better to me than the 69. 
So now I want to sit here and see, do these colors blend well with each other? And for that, I'm just going to give it a swatch test where I'm doing my flick stroke. I always color dark to light. So I'm doing my flick stroke and I'm going over the top of those colors and slightly beyond. And I'm just doing this. This is a standard test that I do with a lot of my markers before I start to color. And what I'm noticing is that when I swatch these out, they're not like auto blending. So I can already tell that this combination is going to give me some trouble. It's the right color, but it may not be a great combination for beginners because when I swatched that out, it didn't auto blend on me. There are a lot of blue combinations that when I swatch them out, just going over the top of it with the next lightest marker, it's going to automatically blend and you're going to get a seamless gradient with very little work. This one, I'm obviously going to have to come back and give this another shot to try and get that gradation from the 79 to the 69 and then I've always known I just know from experience that 66 into 63 is not the most comfortable blend either the 63 into 60 is actually a good blend those those two will blend on their own but I just know that this one is going to need a little bit more ink to make the blend happen you can kind of see how it's starting to happen right up there now, but I had to kind of work with it and give it a few shots of ink to get it to work. I want to know that before I start coloring, because if I start coloring and it's not blending on me and it never will blend, um, that's not the combination to be using. So I'm testing for color and then picking a more suitable color. Then I'm testing the run, and this is a color run, I'm testing that run to make sure that they're going to blend and how easily they will blend and whether I'm going to have to nurse it. Now, I'm not scared of that, but I would not recommend it for beginners. I kind of like it though. I think it's going to work. All right, so this might be my blending combination, except the problem is, is that when you get deep down into those petals, the colors at the base where that blue petal comes out from the purple center, the color that you see in there, most people would call that shade. Uh, we can debate the definition of shade. That's not really an accurate term that colors use. An artist would not call that shade in there. Anyway, the color that's deep in there is desaturated. It's not just darker. The color that's deep in there is not B79. It's something that's dirtier. It's muddier. So that's why I underpaint to create that kind of shade. Sometimes Copic doesn't make a dark enough color, so I have to mix markers to make that shade. Um, other times, like in this case, I need something that's kind of scummier because this color is still too pretty to be the color that's deep in there. Um, and what I'm talking about, let me move it over here, this color right here in there, that is not B79. It's close to B79, but it's dirtier. It's definitely not black, but it's a dirtier version of B79. And I need to be able to duplicate that color to get photorealism. It's not gonna happen with just this. Photorealism does not happen unless you add the mud. So here's that next step then. I need to find an underpaint color that's gonna work underneath the B79 to create that muddy, weird color. Now. I happen to recommend if you're starting with underpaint colors, you could do worse than to go buy the entire BV20 family. These are kind of purple, kind of gray, BV20, BV23, 26 I believe, 25, and then 29. Those are really great markers to start underpainting with. 23 is not nearly dark enough, so I am going to pull out the granddaddy of them all. I'm going to pull out BV29. And now I need to do an underpainting test to see if this BV29 sitting underneath the B79 is going to give me that underpaint. So I'm going to do, this is an underpainting test. Oh, that's nice. So what I'm looking for here is I want this underpainted color to look a step darker than BV79. So if I just put BV29 here and then I put the B79 next to it, 
kind of looks a little darker, but they just, they don't look like they match at all. But this underneath this gives me what looks like would be the next marker if they made something a little darker than B79. So this would be a great underpainting color. It's there, but it blends out nicely. If it's not a good underpainting color, you're going to, you're going to lose it. So here's BV25. And I know that this one isn't gonna work. It's just not strong enough to show up. So here's how you tell when something isn't strong enough. See, you just, you can't see it under there. There's no point in putting that marker underneath it because you can't, it's, it, it doesn't have enough oomph to make a darker shade color. So BB29 is a color that would work, but here's where Amy gets a little crazy. Because if you look around the edges, of the project. If I'm to duplicate this photo in Copic markers, I need to have some green markers, right? Because there's green showing around the edge. I can underpaint with green. I just have to figure out what color I see up there in the photo reference. So, kind of gonna pull out, let me, just this is a stab in the dark. I've not tested this before. I don't know if it's gonna work, but G99 kind of feels like the color that I'm seeing up there in the corner around the edge. That, yeah, that's that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good marker to use for coloring the background. And I could probably do the background in G94 and G99 here. Let's see what it looks like though underneath the B79. Oh, I like that. Okay, so if I'm choosing between this one, which I know will work, and that one is, remember, this one is BV29, and this one is G99. If I'm choosing between this one and this one, I'm always going to choose something that I already have pulled out. I was already going to color the background G99. So why not use the G99 as my underpaint color? Now, as this starts to dry, it does something a little artistic. Okay, and I don't think, I'm looking at it on camera right now, and I don't think you're fully getting what's happening here in real life. So those of you that are at home that want to test this, go ahead and pull out G99 and put some B79 over the top of it. And what's happening here is that the color that's created here looks like a slightly darker blue, but the color that's created here has a green tint to it. It's really cool looking. And that I think is going to be perfect for these dark recesses here where the color is deep and we don't really have a name for that color but i think i can use this g99 under the b79 for this area and i might be able to use g94 for some of the shady areas under there so my blending combination amy's weird remember just never forget i always do things differently weird that's just how my brain starts to work after a while working with color my blending combination for the peri or for the cornflower up there is G99, B79 because it has a violet tint to it, B66 as my middle, B63 gets me that lighter tone and if I need highlights, which I see a few highlights in there, the highlights are not white, they are B60. So that's my blending combination for the cornflower. Hmm. Is it what you would have chosen? Probably not, but that's okay. When you choose your own colors, you're coloring with your unique artistic coloring voice. This is my voice. This is the Amy coming out in my project. Does you no good to color with Amy's voice? You want to have your own voice. So maybe you would have chosen the B29 series because that maybe that's all the blues you have. You can color that with B29 and that's part of your artistic voice coming out. Figure out how to make your markers work in the way that looks pleasing to you. And you probably heard it when I was testing. As soon as I went over this one, I was like, "Ooh, that's a clue. When you're when you automatically out loud say, "Ooh, 
that's a color that you should be choosing. That's a color you should be working with because you should be working with your own voice, not with the blending combination that you found on somebody's website and they guarantee it's gonna blend every single time. It may blend, but it won't be your artistic voice. So that's why I want students to start picking their own blending combinations. Now, when you're taking a class, it's really obnoxious to walk in and mm, the instructor has chosen markers for a reason because she wants to give you a lesson. She wants to make it easy for you. So be respectful. You walk in with the colors that the instructor has called for. It's it's rude to walk in with 99 substitutions into a class. I know that you may not have the markers, but I'm just telling you from the instructor standpoint, I will spend more time trying to help somebody with subst substitutions than I will teaching the main lesson. So don't walk in with your own markers and say, well, Amy told me to pick my own colors. Mm -mm. When you're taking a class, you use what the teacher is trying to convey the lesson for, okay? So you use the supply list, but when you're coloring at home, I want you to find your own voice. Now, last little thing. A lot of people are looking at the photo reference up there and they're saying, great, Amy, you've got a petal combination. You got a weird underpaint and now you've got the periwinkle colors. They're going to go over the, that for those outer petals. What about the center? Because the center, remember when we were taking our little color tour? Lost my photo here. When we were taking our little color tour here, we saw a lot of purple in there. Well, I picked colors and I don't have any purple. Where's my purple? There's a problem when people color multicolored flowers like this, where there's a purple center and then there's a blue on the outside. Now it's different if you're coloring a daisy where the petals are white and the center is yellow. You're obviously going to choose white, a white combination and you're gonna choose a golden combination for the center because they are two opposite colors. But here, when I'm looking at that photo reference up there, I'm seeing a lot of the outer petal periwinkle colors in the center there. It's not just all purple. So if I go shopping for some purple markers, what's gonna happen is it's gonna take on the feel of a daisy where you've got two totally different colors. And sometimes when you do that, it looks like two, two parts of two different plants that people have Frankenstein together. So when I'm looking at a photo like this, I'm not really introducing V markers to make that center color. Instead, what I do is what's called a color kissing method. And I color kiss with colored pencils. So I pulled out my big set of Prismacolor colored pencils and I'm kind of shopping in the pink section and I'm pulling out a, a pencil that we use a lot in classes because it is a transparent pencil. It's called Process Red and it's number P C994 process red. And you can tell I use my colored pencils a lot because they're short. All right. So, for the violet area in there, I am going to or the purple and the violet areas in the center. I'm not using a marker. I'm going to color the whole darn flower with my periwinkle combination here. And then I'm coming back with this process red colored pencil and I'm holding it far away so that I'm very light pressure. And in those center sections, I'm going to do an overpaint of this magenta color. And when I put process red, because it's a transparent colored pencil, over the top of this was B, this was B63 there, this is B60 here, this was B66 and this was B79. Whoops, that's a nine. Okay, so when I put that magenta pencil, or I'm sorry, process red pencil, it's magenta colored, but the color name is process red. When I put this over each one of these colors at a very light pressure, I'm getting that purpley vibe. Oh, this is so pretty, putting this process red over the top of B79. It's kind of got this weird glow to it that 
it's almost not even showing up on camera. It's kind of there, but in person, wow, this is just gorgeous. So the center of the flower is going to be colored with my blending combination. Same thing as the petals on the outside, but I'm going to do kisses of color. So each one of those little stamen-y things in the image is going to get hits just little gentle kisses on the points of this magenta transparent pencil called Process Red. The reason why I keep correcting myself is because it's in the magenta family, so I want you to think magenta. So if you're using something like a Holbein pencil, you're shopping not for the color, or I mean not for the color name, but for the actual color. So you need to be in the magenta family. And I have to be careful because Prismacolor actually makes a pencil called Magenta that I don't really like very much. The Process Red is really more of a true magenta than the actual magenta pencil is. And it's more transparent so you can get this effect. So that's how I'm coloring the center there. I So to rehash what we did here, we kind of pulled up our photo and we gave ourselves just a color tour just getting the feeling for what colors we see in the image. Then we step back and we look at the flower as a whole and we say, what kind of vibe do I get off of it? The vibe that I get feels like the B60 family. So then I started swatching the B60 family and I decided that this one was too blue. And so I added that B79 and took out I took out the 69 and I put in the 79 because it felt more violet. So that's what we did next. Then we swatched the family here to see how easily they would blend. Then we found the underpaint and that's where the G99 came in, but you very easily could have used the BV29. I just like to be crazy and I'm using this color in the background anyway. So that's where the underpaint came in. So we swatched and then we substituted and then we tested to see how well it was going to blend and then we found an underpaint color for underneath there. So then we went in and we found a color, a, a kissing color to just go over the top to give those center ones a bit of color. The last thing that I wanted to address is on this image you can see areas that look white. So out here in the petals there's this kind of area which looks white but that's not really white that's actually b60 right in that area highlights are not often white then again in the center here we're seeing some color that looks whitish but it's actually more of well wow it's probably a v triple zero in that color in that area it's not white so at no point am i ever pulling out um I'm not pulling out a white gel pen to add details of white because you know that's not going to be soft it's not going to be gentle highlights in white gel pen don't look right what i'm going to do is try and reserve some of those areas and keep them in the b60 or keep them the white of the paper and give them a gentle coat of that process right over the top but that would be my color plan for coloring the cornflower here <sighs> I hope you found that instructive. Um, it might be over the head of some people that are still in the beginner stages, but you intermediates and anybody that's taken a class with me where we've started to underpaint, now you're kind of seeing where these underpaint colors are coming from. Take with it what you will. Um, hopefully it was instructive for people. We can do this again. Um, let's see, I'm getting some questions over here. Ha ha! <laughs> Live audience, there are questions. So let me go over here and see if I can see that. All right, so, um, Lore, she's, or Lori, not sure how she pronounces it, but she says, these are my favorite colors. Cool. All right, and then she says, white colored pencil over slightly darker marker. Well, okay, let's go ahead and try that. Um, but it's not going to work the way you think it will. First of all, we're on Express It, and Express It has almost no tooth to it. So it's very hard to get colored pencil to stick to Express It. And then the next thing is, is that white colored pencils in general, they stink. 
there's just no other way around it they just they're terrible white colored pencils are um they're opaque they're not opaque i'm sorry white colored pencils are translucent and of all of them the prismacolor is probably the most opaque but even it is not opaque it is still rather translucent so if i'm going white over the top of that b79 if i'm going white over the top of the g99 if i'm going white over the top of the 69 i am not going to be able to build up enough color to create the value that i see in those highlights even if i press hard it's always going to look weird it's just see look i was pressing really hard that's probably a level five pressure there it's automatically burnished so it's not strong enough once you put down color you can't really resurrect to that level so it's it's not going to help okay so now they're asking um whether that area should be re reserved for an rvoo well you can try and do that but I'll, I'll be perfectly honest what she's saying is that as she or as they color these areas they're going to try and leave some of the white there good luck but i am not good enough to do that i'll, I'll be just flat out honest as I'm coloring, I'm going to go over that area 16 times with the wrong color and you can't lift it up. Once you put it down, it's down there. So no, I'm not very good at reserving areas. If you happen to be one of the three people on earth that are good at reserving areas, then go for it. But in general, if you're paying attention to values, you're not putting super dark colors there anyway. Um, the other problem is, is that highlights done in Copic never look proper okay so i did not intend for this to be a super long demonstration um i've handled a few questions but um yeah it's really hard to hold a conversation with the with the comments there i can answer questions but it's really hard to go back and forth and have somebody clarify what they meant to say 30 seconds ago so yeah uh, we'll have to figure out a way um, if I do these more often we'll have to figure out a way to um, get questions answered um, clearly yeah I have to think about that okay so I am about to head out on vacation for the month of August August is my month off so you won't see me on the forums um, probably won't see me on Facebook either because I really do try to unplug but um, I'm gonna kind of watch and see what happens with um, how many people watch the replay of this video and what the um, general reception is. And maybe we'll add this to the rotation. You know, maybe I can drop into Facebook once a week or a couple of times a month and do some of this thinking out loud. So, um, cool. All right, so that's the cornflower. Um, thinking process. Um, I hope it was beneficial. Let me know what you think in the comments, whether this is something that, um, whether I rambled on too much or um, whether I should start talking more about something else that you need to know about. Um, I'm open to suggestions on what we do with this, but it was a fun experiment. All right. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Thanks for watching. And I will see you on the forums definitely in September. Okay. Bye.